What's going on everybody? This is John Jake Gaming on the mic here coming at you with a brand new rebuild using the modern NCAA rosters and this time we attempt to build the Memphis Tigers not only into a conference power but potentially a national power given that we are located in the southeast. It's going to be a good one. We are going to try to do a five-year rebuild or get fired trying so it's gonna be a good one make sure you smash that like button hit subscribe as well if you do happen to be brand new to the channel and with that being said let's go ahead and take a look at the pipeline states that we start with the roster that we have as well as our schedule for year number one so first and foremost this is the roster that we are going to be starting off with and honestly we got some solid skies I mean we're led you know, we got an 88 overall sophomore in Quendell Johnson. We also have an 87 junior in Dylan Parham. You know, there's some talent on this roster, but let's go ahead and take a deeper dive real quick. Quarterback, will have Grant Gunnell starting for us. He's a sophomore quarterback out of Woodlands, Texas, followed by a sophomore and a freshman. Running back, we're incredibly young. Rodriguez Clark is going to get the nod to start, but going to see some Kylan Watkins as well. He'll be, they'll be like our our one-two punch you know going into this thing definitely youthful at that position wide receiver outside of calvin austin the fur you know don't have a lot of experience behind him so you know we'll have to see some of these young guys develop but we don't necessarily have to go for wide receivers that early unless there's some guys that really stand out and you know can bring a lot to the table tight end we'll have sean dykes who's an 87 he's from houston texas Offensive line's looking pretty good. We got Austin Myers. We got Isaac Ellis. Jakari Robertson. R right side will be a little bit questionable. We got Evans Fields as a 77. But Dylan Parham, like I said, probably an NFL caliber player. He's an 87. So we really only have one weak spot on the line of the offensive line. So I feel good about that. Defensively, we will be running a 3-4 multiple scheme. And starting with our left end, we got Morris John Joseph, followed by John Cartwright, who I did decide the red shirt for this season. Right side, we'll have John Tate the fourth. He's a 79, so we got to work on the defensive line a little bit. Greg Emerson is the starting defensive tackle. He's going to be an 82 overall. Definitely pretty athletic for a six foot three, 300 pound guy. 75 speed for a defensive tackle. That's extremely good. He's going to be a whole problem. But now we jump into the linebackers. Left outside, we got Jaleel Clemens. He's a 78. Two middle linebackers going to be J.J. Russell and Zay Collins, but they're both seniors. So we got to make sure we develop Jalen Sims and Cole Massburn on top of it. Right outside, finally, we got Thomas Pickens, but he's also a senior. Oh, we have Dedrick Smith backing him up right now, as well as Rush Winstall. So definitely need to get some outside linebackers in the building. For the secondary, to round out this roster, got Jacoby Francis and Jalen Barnett, two solid guys. Quindell Johnson, who's the best player on our team, in my opinion, and then Rodney Owens, as well as Tyrez Windy. So two um, guys that could start for us. And strong safety, they're both going to get playing time over Greg Rubin. And finally, we got a pretty young special teams unit. Noah Grant's a freshman at 70, and Joe Doyle is only a 71. So our special teams isn't that great, but we do at least have a solid roster. As for what our recruiting pipelines are going to be looking like, obviously we do have the state of Tennessee, as that is where Memphis is located, but we got a few other solid pipelines to work with. We also have Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas to go along with all of that. So definitely some really good pipelines to work with. Texas is an important one to keep. And right now we do have eight players in the pipeline, but we are currently projected to maybe lose out on this pipeline if we don't get enough Texas players before next season. So definitely need to recruit Texas hard in order to recruit, keep this pipeline, which is going to be really important for this rebuild. And finally, this is what our schedule is going to be looking like going into year number one. And honestly, we do have a lot of bye weeks to get the season started. We have one free bye weeks within the first five weeks of the season, where we start off with out of conference opponents, Kentucky and Arkansas State. Then we do a little bit of conference play. We got UCF, uh, Duke at home. Then we got ECU at home. 
Tulane on the road. And then we also play against the Cincinnati Bearcats on the road as well. Then we round out with three of our last five games being at home. We take on FCSE, Southern Florida, and then Tulsa will be our senior day. We'll also have Navy and Temple on the road as well for our year one schedule. It's a C minus strength of schedule. It's not something that I'm too terribly concerned about, but let's see where we project in comparison to the rest of the American Conference. All right, boys. So for year number one here with the Memphis rebuild, you know, we're, we're projected to finish six out of 11 teams in the American Conference. But honestly, I'm looking at the rest of the American Conference right now, and we are it's a pretty open conference you know no one has like too big of an advantage of course Cincinnati is the favorite but that being said I mean like we're not too far off it's definitely possible that we could finish towards the top of the conference last this year or towards the bottom it's just a matter of how we get things executed over the course of the season and with that being said I will sim all the gameplay to year number one I'll see you guys at the end of the regular season with an update for you guys all right, boys, so we did end up making through the first regular season with the Memphis Tigers, and we finished right where we were expected to finish. We ended up going 6-6 six and six with a 3-5 and five conference record, but it was really interesting how we managed to get to this point, right? So we were off to a really good start. We were, you know, 3-1, and one, um, only losing to a number 12-ranked UCF, and then... We had a really big losing streak, right? Lost to East Carolina, Tulane, Cincinnati, even lost to an FCS team. But then we turned it around. We won three of our next four games in order for us to at least be bull eligible, but wanted to be a tad bit better here in season number one. But, you know, we got that bull eligibility. We're one of eight teams from the American Conference that are bull eligible. Now, we'll go ahead now and see if we are projected to go to any bowl games. So as of right now, we would be projected to go to a New Year's Day bowl game. We'd be going to the first responder bowl. It was formerly known as the Heart of Dallas Bowl. Now, we would take on Western Kentucky if this holds up. But with that being said, I got to get through conference championship weekend real quick. And I'll see what bowl game that we actually get to go to if we get to go to a bowl game in the first place. So fingers crossed, hopefully we get to go to a bowl game this year. So we will indeed take on Western Kentucky in the Sev Sev Pro First Responder Bowl down in Dallas, Texas. So we do get to at least go to a bowl game here in season number one. Let's check out our opponent. And honestly, I like our chances. We match up really well against Western Kentucky. Their C plus is across the boards. We're B's across the board. And statistically, we're better in most categories with the exception of scoring offense that did kind of hold us back over the course of this season however we do not have any injuries that we have to worry about or you know nothing like that so that being said we'll, I'll, we'll go down to the field we'll see if we can take down Bailey Sappy and this Western Kentucky squad let's we'll see if we can get this rebuild off right and win in the first responder bowl I'll see you on the field all right, boys, so we are down here at the first responder bowl, man. Western Kentucky is going to get this ball first because we did win the coin toss. We end up deferring to the second half, so okay. We'll see what our boys can do. We got the better squad, but Western Kentucky, we know that they got a very dangerous quarterback on the other side, so should be a really interesting matchup for sure, but right now things are right about even. No one's taking a big advantage early on. You know, need our talent to really step in. We got to finish these drives, man. We had two drives in the red zone and couldn't get a touchdown in either of them. So not what I wanted to see, although that interception could have helped us. Except, of course, we do not turn those into points. Finally, we get a touchdown. We're up 13 to 7. It's still a pretty close game right now as Memphis gets another scored allowed. And now West Kentucky, they do end up taking their biggest lead of the entire game so far but we get a touchdown ourselves fail the two-point conversions follow that up with almost another score it could still go either way we got a lead temporarily we lost it and now looks like west kentucky no we win it at the last second we're gonna win let's go baby 
Oh, we had. I thought we were gonna lose that game. I really did. Like, well, we gotta check out that scoring summary real quick to see what went down there in that last quarter, right? So it was a really tight game the entire time. I mean, don't get it twisted about that. So Western Kentucky, they they scored with 3:30 left to make it a one-point game, and then we also saw them hit a field goal with 148 left. That made it to where. Our last drive, we had to go from, you know, getting a field goal to a touchdown to win the thing. But thankfully, Gunnell just came through 74-yard touchdown pass to win the game. And we were able to hold on. So we'll win the first responder bowl. And it just feels good, man. It feels good to finish the year on top. Grant Grinnell played all right in this one. Would love to complete percentage to be a little bit higher. But still, 412 yards and three touchdowns. I won't complain there. Rodriguez Clark almost got to 100 yards and so did Kylan Watkins so our running back duo looked pretty good overall Watkins did end up finding his way into the end zone receiving wise Calvin Austin the third looked great 137 yards and a touchdown but Kylan Watkins he was a star in this one man two only two catches but a long of 74 yards that was the game winning touchdown that this guy scored right so 122 yards two touchdowns Definitely deserves that player of the game for sure. Austin Myers ended up with double-digit pancakes. And then Solante Oliver in his last collegiate game, he ends up with nine tackles in a TFL. That leads all tacklers. Morris Joseph gets five tackles. And then Jaleel Clemens also ends up getting five tackles. Only got to his quarterback twice, though. Thomas Pickens and Morris Joseph end up with sacks. And then we do also see Rodney Owens with an interception. And we also get a forced fumble from Solante Oliver. I actually kind of missed this, to be honest with you. But we forced a couple of turnovers. And, hey, it was an exciting ball game. Bailey Sapp, he did his best to lead his guys. But we just had a better roster on our end. And we're going to finish year one on a high note, winning the first responder bowl. But if we want to go ahead and get ourselves better for year number two, we need a little bit better quarterback play. Sure, we had almost 3,000 yards passing. 18 touchdowns, but we also threw 17 interceptions and we had less than a 50% completion percentage. That would not fly in today's college football. Peter Parrish did also play a little bit as well. He ended up 14 for 26, 117 yards, touchdown, and a pick. Now, rushing wise, we saw Rodriguez Clark have himself a real good sophomore campaign overall. Over a thousand yards, he had 10 touchdowns. That's a really good sophomore campaign. Kylan Watkins looked pretty good too, 675 and 5 touchdowns. Also saw Grant Grinnell chip in with 198 yards and 2 touchdowns on the ground as well. Now for the receivers, Calvin Austin III, he had a pretty solid campaign, 900 yards receiving, 8 touchdowns. We'll see if that's enough to get him to the NFL, but that 5'9", 162 frame might keep NCAA 14 from allowing him to be an NFL pick. Even though Devontae Smith at roughly 150 pounds is a solid first round pick for the Eagles at this point. But Javon Ivory also chipped in. 548, two touchdowns. Caden Pri Priestcorn? I don't know why I'm struggling with that so much. But for the Detroit, the Detroit product ended up with 350 yards and two touchdowns. Rodriguez Clark had 291 in a tub. Kylan Watkins, 283 and three touchdowns, most of which I'm pretty sure came into the bowl game, so that's cool. Rock Taylor got a couple of touchdowns, and then Sean Dykes did end up with a touchdown as well. He was our starting tight end for uh, over the course of his season. Now, for blocking, I really like what the offensive line was able to do, and the beautiful thing is, is we're going to have four of our top five pancake guys coming back. Um, they're all juniors, I believe. Yes, they are. Um, Austin Myers is the only starting offensive lineman that is going to graduate. So, better offensive line play to be expected in year two. Uh, Morris Joseph did lead the way in tackles. And doing so by a long shot, ended up with 83 tackles, 20 TFLs, and 5.5 and sacks. That was close to the team lead. Joey O'Clemens and Thomas Pickin each ended up with 60 plus tackles as well. But as for the pass rush, that was John Tate the fourth taking care of business. Ended up with six and a half sacks over the course of the season, so that's a good look. Um, him and Joseph are the only guys 
to have more than five sacks over the course of the season. However, even though we didn't have somebody, anybody with a ton of interceptions, we had a lot of turnovers regardless. Swante Oliver set the tone, leading the team in interceptions with three. But we also saw guys like Thomas Pickens, Quindell Johnson, Tyrus Lindsey, Jacoby Francis, and Rodney Owens all with multiple interceptions. And that's not all. We saw Tyrus Lindsey also forcing multiple fumbles. He got three forced fumbles over the course of the season. With Swante Oliver having a nice nose for the football as well, he ended up with three fumble recoveries. Thomas Pickens also deserves his love. He got two fumble recoveries as well. And not to mention, we got two defensive touchdowns, Julian Barnett and Sanchez Blake Jr. scoring. And I thought I saw maybe a field goal and punt blocks. Yeah, Jacoby Francis also got himself a punt block. So really good stuff from our defense this year. One of the best defenses in college football, actually. And now we go into the offseason to try to build off of this 7-6 campaign. Now, the good news for us to start this offseason is that we do get at least another contract to work with. So, we finished seven and six. They're offering a five year extension. And we're definitely going to go ahead and sign it because it is a Memphis rebuild, of course. And you gotta go ahead and take that so that we don't get fired, unlike in one of the other rebuilds that I've had previously. It, it happens to me, man. So, feels like a good start to me. So we will have one person going to the NFL, looks like, and it's Quindell Johnson. He's going to be declaring as, oh, wait a minute, this is our sophomore red shirt. Okay, no, we're, uh, we're going to have you stay, you know, because seven round picks, most seven round picks do not make it to a second NFL contract. So he'll be doing a lot better if he just stayed in school for at least another year. And if next year he wants to declare again, if he's a top three pick top three round pick of course uh he'll do that um Kai Mafio he didn't really play much this year four for 58 but he is going to transfer because he is feeling homesick and we're just going to let him go uh I'm not going to fight somebody that's feeling a little homesick but we'll have to check out and see real fast as well if we do have any new coordinators that we're going to be working with uh, over the course of season number two, we're of course are going to stay, but it looks like we will have a new defensive coordinator, Wu Espiato. He's going to take over a defense that finished in the top 15 this past season, second in the conference. We'll see if we can get that offense right. I think if we can keep the same defensive intensity as well as you know improve our offense, I think we'll do a lot better and we can flirt with a double digit win season. If we just do those things but that being said though we do have somebody coming in through the transfer portal though and it looks like Trey Bull wants to come to Memphis he is a tight end from Lake Forest who did not play last year but has some good athletic stats he just needs to really work on his skill sets a little bit before he sees the field on a more consistent basis but I am going to go ahead and admit him he will use one of my 25 scholarships so speaking of recruiting, we actually only have four scholarships left to work with. I mean, we signed plenty of players, but we couldn't get a lot of high-end talent necessarily. It's going to be a lot of developmental guys. A few exceptions, of course, is, of course, Michael Baker, who we did end up finding through the Lil' Lock Cheese. Four-star wide receiver from Palestine, Texas. He is a gem, and he's a 93 speed, so that's going to be super helpful for us down the line. We did also end up signing a couple of, you know, guys like Tommy Peterson. He's a he's a Juco. And then Jeremy Johnson, he's a free star, free safety as well. So I might move one of these guys over to strong safety. Other than that, you know, in terms of guys we already signed, I mean, got a lot of developmental players um, that do need a little bit of work and need a little bit of smoothing off the uh, rough edges. But there's two guys that I am keying in on, Lewis Miller being one of them. He's 5'11", 178, and is a free star product from Faraday, Louisiana. He's a 70 overall, got some good speed, needs to work on his man coverage a little bit, but being in a safety position, that's not that big of a deal. And then we're also in a recruiting battle for Richie West, it's between us, SMU, and Louisiana Monroe. I love his skill sets overall. 
he does have the ability to be a decent coverage guy down the line but has some pretty solid athletic attributes for a linebacker i do love all of that he's a three-star guy from De deerfield beach florida and he'll be a good fit for a program so if we get a couple other guys to sign that's cool but i'm mainly concerned about bringing these two defensive players into my football program as we get ready for the next season we'll see what happens it's okay so it does look like we end up signing at least three guys including the two guys that we wanted in lewis miller and richie west plus a quarterback in brian wilcox who probably will be red shirted but we do end up signing four prospects and we do end up signing the top recruiting class in the american conference you know pretty much thanks to the fact that we did bring in 25 guys so let's check out our top recruiting class we're actually 40th right so we did end up signing a couple of four stars uh ho is one of them but he's a little bit of a bust to be honest with you but you know it's a decent little class a lot of these guys are going to need development they're not going to be ready yet don't be surprised if some of these you know lesser players do end up getting cut if we have more than 70 players on our roster when that part of the offseason comes but that being said it's not a bad recruiting class so here we are now at position changes and one of the first things that we need to do is figure out where to put joey cannon he is a free star juco from Seymour, tennessee it looks like he's an offensive weapon you know in the 70s there although not too shabby as a safety as well so go ahead and take a look around did we sign any running we actually did not sign any running backs this past season and it'll get like a seven point boost or not a seven point eight point boost i'll go ahead and put joey cannon up as a 72 and he'll at least put himself in a position to eventually play someday or at least form a future tamble with jp morgan now one of the things that i do need to do because i did not sign a fullback and to prevent really a lock-on from coming onto the team i'm going to move john barber from his position and move him over to fullback he does jump down to a 59 but it, it would be a little bit better than really having a a 40 overall fullback that i'm going to be forced to keep anyway so at least it's, it's somebody that could be a little bit more usable so that's why i do that and then to round out the offensive line what i am going to go ahead and do is i'm going to take marcus lawson take him from the left hand side and move him over to the right guard position so that i'm at least free deep and he'll be set to potentially start once both evan fields and matt dale graduate at the conclusion of this season Meanwhile, on the defensive side of the football, I am also actually going to take Jalen Allen, move him from left outside linebacker, move him over to the right so that he has a chance to play a little bit in his um, in his senior year. Uh, and he should be starting over Jedrick Smith and Rush Wensdale, so that should be going on his side. Got good strength too, so that should be really helpful. Going to see if there's anything else that I want to change, maybe in the secondary and i think we're good actually in the secondary we'll go ahead and move on on over to training results see how many 90 overall guys we get to work with all right man so it looks like we'll have four nfl caliber players potentially you know five or six depending on how progression goes during the middle of the season uh quindell johnson he came back um after being projected seventh round pick we'll also have dylan parman at right tackle grant gunnell who actually moves up to a 92 um he had he improved by seven points got a great arm and his awareness isn't terrible either which is really important and then of course jakari robinson he's plus seven as well with rodriguez clark and julian barnett potentially can work themselves on an nfl draft board depending on how the season goes as well so loving what i'm seeing there quarterback room getting better running backs got a bunch of really good running backs three of the top four though are seniors so jp morgan's gonna have to be ready to step up and step up quickly for us meanwhile at wide receiver we'll have one solid wide receiver and javon ivory but the rest of the wide receiver room might take a little bit of work however although we did sign an 80 overall wide receiver so that's gonna really help offensive line is gonna be even better don't have any weaknesses or anything like that this season so the offensive line should be one of our strong points this upcoming season 
And then, of course, linebacker. Got a couple of good linebackers. Um, not in the middle, though. So, still need to work on our line, uh, linebacking core. Just a tad, but, you know, and, of course, like, our, our secondary. But, at least on the defensive side of football, the, the D line should be solid. But we knew that signing 25 guys, we were going to end up cutting some of these freshmen that we did end up bringing in. And Ronald Rodgers is going to go first. I... I don't know why, how we managed to get on the team, but it is what it is. We will end up cutting five more players after this. Darius Griffin's going to go. Darren Temple, he's going to go as well. Wide receiver, we're fine. Joel Calhoun can leave. Brian Wilcox, he's only a 61. And now things get a little bit interesting. Now I cut a couple of middle linebackers already. So my last cut is actually going to be Robert Stevenson in this case. He's, you know, he's a 64, he's okay, but I did sign quite a few defensive linemen. So, I'm not going to be hurt, you know, cutting him from our team. And this is going to be our final 70, man. We'll see how where our wide receiver one stacks out. Uh, Michael Baker, that's our top recruit. He's actually going to be our second best wide receiver and should make an immediate impact on our football program. But before we jump into season number two officially, let's go ahead and check out some of the red shirts that we are going to make um, on our football roster. Starting off at the running back position, I am red shirting Joey Cannon. He does look a lot more promising than when we brought him in as a Juco athlete, but still going to be buried on that depth chart and need some time for a little bit of seasoning. So going to let him red shirt there. And then on the defensive side of football, I'm going to make some more red shirts as well. Joe Sims is going to get red shirt because he's going to be buried on the depth chart. And then the other player that I wanted to red shirt was Jeremy Johnson. He's going to be a good safety, I think, for us one day. He has the best athleticism out of the rest of the group, in my opinion. But that being said, going to be buried on the depth chart. Quindell Johnson is a star. And then there's two other guys that are also ahead of him already. So... Jeremy Johnson getting redshirted definitely makes the most sense. Now, as for what our schedule is going to be looking like for year two, we start off pretty easy. We have a FCS game to begin the season, then Mid-Tennessee State. Then we start with Navy, who finished 2-10 last year, followed by road games against Tulsa, UCLA. And then this is where the, the second half of the schedule gets a little bit tri tricky, right? got Tulane who's ranked in the preseason top 25 also got BYU who's solid Cincinnati who's a top won the conference last year UCF who is really good and we got to go to the bounce house for that then we round things out with Temple East Carolina and Southern Florida to end our season so that being said we got to get to a hot start and then try to sustain that through the second half we'll see where we're going to project within the American Conference are we going to be higher or lower all right, man, so we're moving ourselves up a little bit in the uh, in the American Conference. We're actually picked to finish fifth this season, and three of the top four teams are in the top 25. So, I mean, we're right there in shouting distance, you know, of these top teams. You know, their prestiges are not that much different from ours, to be honest. I mean, we could be a sleeper, but we just got to get off to a better start and beat the teams that we're supposed to beat. I mean, we lost to an FCS team and Navy last year. If we can do that and pull some upsets along the way, we can do some special things. And with that, I'll see you at the end of this regular season to see if we have any improvement or we end up taking that step back. All right, boys. So we end up actually clinching at least a lion shares of the American Athletic Conference here in year number two and we actually finished with an 11 and one record and we're the number 10 team in college football bro like that is a very good look for our program we'll go ahead and see real fast if we ended up you know winning it outright or did we end up sharing with another school and we did have to share with smu but we did not play smu so that's how we got the championship apparently um yeah, man, we'll have to see what SMU end up doing. They only lost to UCF. And as for us, we did end up being UCF, and our only loss was to Tulsa. And that was their only win, bro. 
Tulsa won one game the entire season, and it was to us, man. So that was a that was a tough pill to swallow. But we end up, you know, with a really good season, nonetheless. We'll have to see where we're going in terms of bowl games. I am concerned that we are going to make our way to the Birmingham Bowl because sometimes it, they be doing us bad like that. But scrolling down and hey, we're looking like a Fiesta Bowl appearance except against SMU. So that's really weird. Uh, I'm sure we're going to work that out. But I'll see you guys there when we figure out which bowl game we're actually going to. Okay, so it actually turns out that we will play SMU. Now, I don't know how this works out because we are in the same conference, but I guess this will be a de facto conference championship game because we did tie SMU for the American Conference crown and they're number four in the nation. So that's really interesting, but we'll go ahead once everything gets settled. We'll take a look at how good this SMU squad is. And I think we match up pretty well against them personally. Uh, they're a B, B plus, B minus, we're B plus, B plus, B. They have a better offensive unit, but our defense is better than yet theirs, though. So, their offense versus our defense, that is going to be the matchup to watch for. And if the defense can do its job, well, we got the, a number five scoring offense in America ourselves. So, we'll go ahead and jump into this thing. We'll super sim as well, and we'll see if we can win this one. Win the Fiesta Bowl and kind of win the American Conference Championship. It's, it's, it's a unique situation, but we ain't scared of any uh, competition. All right, man. So here we are at the Testidos Fiesta Bowl as well as basically the American Conference Championship game. Let's go ahead and get these things going. We did end up winning the coin toss and we're going to get some things underway and we will end up striking first. We will get the first touchdown on the board taking an early seven make that 14 to nothing lead and we're trying to open up a can of whoop ass on the smu mustangs early we're up 21 to nothing before they even bother to put the first points on the board right now and we get an interception but we can't do anything with the interception though we do get a long touchdown run that will make it 28 to 14 after SMU's latest touchdown, but we're putting a lot of points on the board here early. Already putting up 31 before we even get into the second half. Now, we got to finish strong. Don't want to give up this big lead. That would be a really embarrassing thing to do. But now SMU scored. It's now a 10-point game. Things can still get really interesting now as we punt the football away. Oh, I guess we got a field goal out of it. It's showing a touchback. So I don't know what, what was going on with that, but got two possession leave nonetheless. And it looks like unless something crazy absolutely happens here, man, we're going to end up winning this Fiesta Bowl, winning this one by two possessions. We win by a final score of 41 to 28, man. So we get that Fiesta Bowl victory. You absolutely love to see it, man. So we'll check out these team stats real quick. As we ended up with over 600 yards of total offense, we dominated SMU. We had 400 for the air, 223 on the ground, whereas they had 260 for the air, 123 on the ground. We had we were pretty solid with third down conversions, one for two on fourth downs. Uh, could have done a little bit better in the red zone, but we did win the turnover battle. And that's the most important thing to me. Ended up with two turnovers, tons of penalties, but hey, a win's a win. And we're going to finish the year 12-1. One of the best seasons in Memphis football history. As for how the individual players have done, we saw Grand Gannell have himself a little bit of a day. 382 yards and two touchdowns. While uh, Rodriguez Cork threw a trick pass, he was able to get one to go for 19. So that was cool to see. Speaking of Rodriguez Clark, he did end up being absolutely electric on the ground. 29 carries, 177 yards and two touchdowns. Grand Gannell... Also chipped in with 34 yards and a tub himself. But can we talk about Javon Ivory real quick? This man was on an absolute mission today. 12 catches, 218 yards, and two touchdowns. One of the best Fiesta Bowl appearances in the bowl game history, man. So that's a great look. Offensive line did a really fantastic job as well. And then... The defense, the defense did his thing, man. Got a couple of turnovers. Jalen Sims led the way with seven tackles with Devontae Golden Nelson and Julian Barnett with six tackles apiece. 
did not get to this quarterback, interesting enough. But Greg Rubin only ended up with two tackles. He ended up having both of the interceptions, Dave. As a true sophomore making an impact, he's going to be a really good player down the line. And he, I think he had his breakout game moment as well. But you can let me know down in the comments what you think about that. So one thing that we certainly know, that this was a record-breaking year. We saw Ivory break the school record for most catches in a season with 98. And that was actually the only school record. I was expecting a little bit more, to be honest. But let's see if we did end up seeing anybody in the top five for the season. Greg Grinnell, he ends up sixth place in the NCAA with 3,400 yards. He develops a little bit better than he did last season. And that was really a big reason why we ended up doing as well as we did this year. Rushing, no receiver. Ivory, there's our man, top five in the NCAA. Almost 1,400 yards receiving in, you know, and this was without a conference championship game. If we had a conference championship game, I'm competing for that number one spot. I have a feeling that we would have been able to do that. Tackling, no um, inner sack guys. Cartwright was our leading sack person, and we only had three and a half. So, got to do a little bit better with the pass rush. Same thing with interceptions. Only had three interceptions. And then for shits and giggles, do we have anyone, you know, in that top five for kicking and Grant was actually kind of close his longest was 52 yards but a pretty good statistical season as well but what small steps do we need to take in order to become a national champion this might be the off season that we might do it I'll see you guys there all right so we start with this off season with the players that are planning on leaving our program and we do have a couple of interesting things first and foremost Rodriguez Clark is declaring for the NFL draft but he's projected as a seventh round pick so once again I am going to ask him to stay he'll at least be coming back for his senior year somebody that would not be coming back and somebody that I did redshirt was Tom Mead now he is feeling homesick a hair forged Texas product he's gonna go back to North Texas um, I'm not gonna try to convince him to stay because he is homesick but we should have at least one NFL player, Dylan Parham. He's going to be projected as a fourth round pick. Still a day free guy, but will be a nice boost for the prestige of our program when it comes to convincing guys that, hey, you can come to Memphis and make it to the NFL. But we do also get ourselves a new offensive coordinator, and honestly, I'm really excited for it. Sean Clark joins the staff, and he is a level 22 he is almost maxed out as a coordinator. He's going to be a huge add. He's going to provide plenty of attribute boosts for our offense. And I'm super stoked for it because we got some great pieces on the offensive side of football that are going to be coming back for next season. But it looks like not only do we get one person to the NFL, but we'll actually get two people to the NFL. We knew about Dylan Parham, who's a fourth round pick, but... Greg Emerson sneaks his way in there because of some of the players that did end up deciding to stay. He sneaks into the seventh round. So we ended up with two pros or two players in the NFL instead of one. So that's a really nice bonus. I do love that. Do we have anybody in the transfer portal? No. So we lost somebody in the transfer portal. However, we do not gain anyone in the transfer portal. And that's going to be, that's a little tough, but we got some things going in recruiting that I think you guys will be excited about. So here we are in off-season recruiting, and we do have six scholarships to work with. However, there's three guys I'm really keying in on. First of all, we got the two athletes, Paul Kane, who is a 79 overall, and he is a gem as well. And we're the only school going after him right now, so I want to finish that off. I also want to finish off the recruiting of Brandon Atkins. He's also a gem guy, plus nine in overall. He'll be a great add for a program. The four-star from Dearborn, Michigan. He'll be a good add for us. And then, of course, want to get a quarterback, number two quarterback in America, Ashton Meadows. He's a four-star guy. Not as high of an overall that we were expecting. He's a minus five, but still good enough to play college football. And I still want to bring him in. He'll beef up a recruiting class that already has Corey Baker on the offensive line, he's a free star, and then Rob Taylor on the defensive side of football, he's a actual four-star guy, and that also includes guys like Curtis Brown and Luke Hughes, so we got some dudes on this team, hopefully you can bring in the likes of Jason Johnson, 
Adam Patton, Stefan Peoples. Um, but I just want to make sure we get the guys that I really want on this team. We may not get our full 25, but if some of these 70 overall guys want to join the team as well, we can get them. That's a bonus. But Ashton Meadows, Brandon Atkins, and Paul Kane, those are my priorities. And we'll see how signing day goes. All right, guys. So not only do we get the free guys that we want in Paul Kane, Atkins, and Ashton Meadows, but we do also get Sam Jones um, as a bonus. And then we also got Clay Gibson and Leron Davis kind of as depth pieces. Probably, maybe we'll get cut. But we do end up signing a full allotment of 25 guys again. And not only do we sign the top comp recruiting class in the conference once again but we signed a top 25 recruiting class last year we were in the top 40 barely we were number 40 in the nation but yeah man i'm ecstatic about this class we end up with a number 22 overall class in this one definitely putting ourselves in a position to compete long term especially knowing that we got four four star players in the pipeline man Gonna have to figure out where to put those athletes, but I'll tell you what, I'm excited for what this class can bring to the table as we get ready for year three. So once again, we find ourselves trying to figure out where we want to put our athletes that we got, and look at this, Paul Kane has 90 speed and could fit really well at quarterback. We'll see if there's anywhere else that we can put him, but looks like quarterback's actually his best spot, so we'll put Paul Kane at quarterback. And we'll see if Brandon Atkins is the same thing. Now, I don't want to put too many people at quarterback at the same time. So, Atkins, I'm going to go ahead and bump over to halfback. And now we got somebody that could potentially be, that could play right away um, once Rodriguez Clark is done. Uh, depends on how JP Morgan and Joey Cannon do end up progressing. Quarterback. We're going to get ready for life after him. Right now, could be Paul Kane or Keelan Brown as like a placeholder. And then we'll see Paul Kane take over in like year five, where he'll just basically tear up the college football world. But right now, got two really good quarterbacks. At right guard, I do actually have two guys here um, that are sitting behind Marcus Watson. I'm going to go ahead and move Michael Kroll over to that right tackle position uh just because we have you know nobody behind royce white right now and i want to give him some more experience more reps at right tackle meanwhile over at left end what i think i'm going to go ahead and do is i'm gonna go move cameron johnson from left end over to right end and the reason i want to do that is because we do have rob taylor who's the number five defensive lineman in the country but I want to have a little bit more depth here, and I think Cameron Jackson will be a good veteran piece to have, while Rob Taylor we kind of work in slowly but surely. So you want to talk about having a little bit of hype behind this team. We got two 99 guys in Grant Grinnell and Quindell Johnson. We also got Rodriguez Clark, Julian Barnett, John Cartwright, and Javon Ivory. But I have a pretty good set of dudes, man. We got some star talent on this team. Rest of the roster needs to catch up a little bit, but some of it is a little bit younger, so I'm not as concerned. You know, they'll be ready to step in in the future. Um, so granted, Peter Paris, you know, I'm surprised he actually didn't transfer. He should transfer in real life. Running backs, JP Morgan jumps up to an 81, so he'll be a quality backup. Wide receiver, you know, behind Ivory, we'll also have Michael Baker, who is a true sophomore, by the way. Samir Nash as the number three, Rock Taylor as the four, and then Brian Davis as the five. So we'll have a good starting five with Markel Jones and Cameron Wright waiting in the wings. Tight end should be looking pretty good, although two of them will graduate after this season. Offensive line. Could be a little bit interesting. Mark and Marcus Watson's the only veteran at right guard. And Royce Wright is the only veteran at right tackle. So the right side of the offensive line could be a little bit shaky. Not as good as last year, but we'll have a good set of guys regardless. John Cartwright's going to be a stud. And then Cameron Jackson, he'll be, you know, at least a good veteran presence over on the right side. Gajon Robinson's good. Linebackers. We will have a nice little starting core other than Rush Winsdale. I wish he was a little bit better, but it is what it is. He'll, he'll grow into it. And then secondary, secondary should be good to go. 
We got four guys over 80, so they can cover anyone. Obviously, Kendall Johnson and then Greg Rubin, who really had that breakout game in the Fiesta Bowl last year. He'll, he jumps up to an 80 overall, so... I mean, other than the linebackers, I feel really good about our defense. So we have six cuts that we do need to make, and coincidentally, uh, we got six players that we need, well, we got a bunch of 50 overalls that just ain't gonna fly. We gotta get them up out of here, man. I can't be having any of that. Are gonna lose the Georgia Pipeline, unfortunately, because of that, but, like, I can't have, like, anyone under than, like, a 50 or uh, 59 really, uh, like, waste time on my roster. Um, let's see, halfback or, let's, let's check out halfback real quick, what we got going on, yeah, so we'll have four running backs, I'll need John Scales, so we'll, we'll let him go, and that should be what our roster is going to be looking like, man, I'm excited to see what we can do this year, might be relying a little bit more on the high-end talent than usual, but that being said though, we'll see what we can do in regards to, you know, really making some noise here in year number three. All right, boys, so we ended up signing four freshmen at quarterback, so um, I think we're good at quarterback for the rest of this rebuild. Uh, they're all going to be redshirted, of course, because I don't need them to play till at least next season. We're good at quarterback. Running back, I am going to also redshirt Brandon Atkins. You know, he, he's going to be the fastest of our running backs, but he's going to be behind Rodriguez Clark, who's an All-American, and J.P. Morgan. So, let him sit behind those two veterans, let him get a little bit of seasoning, and he can compete for that starting job next season. Over on the defensive side of the football, I am going to redshirt Andrew Chapman because we're in a 3-4. He's a fourth-string guy, and frankly, not as strong as the other defensive tackles, so... Gonna redshirt him to get his strength up a little bit, get him in a weight room. At cornerback, I am going to also redshirt Alonzo Robertson and Daniel Robinson. They are not brothers, I promise, but um, they need to work on their coverage skills and their awareness, so we're gonna get that redshirt as well. So we come in as the number nine ranked team in America in the preseason polls, and non conference schedule? Not looking that hard. I mean, we got Missouri at home following with road games against Kansas, Bowling Green, and Navy, who is at the bottom of the American Conference last time I checked. Then we had home games versus Tulsa, and we have our final non-conference game against Vanderbilt, which, for an SEC school, you can uh, draw harder teams for sure, to put it lightly. Then we finish up with a six-game stretch where we take on three ranked opponents in the top 25. We got UCF, who's ranked number 13, SMU is number 23 in the nation, and then on the road against number 22 Tulane. So, the second half of the schedule, once again, going to be a little bit tougher, so got to take advantage of this first half and make some things shake, man. So, I'm curious to see what our overall is, and so we'll go ahead and check that real quick, and then we'll get this simulating for year three underway. All right, boys, so easy to say that we are projected to win the American Conference once again, but I don't even have to scroll down in the preseason polls before to find us. We're up there with the likes of Alabama, Georgia, Oklahoma, Michigan, Ohio State, Florida is up in there as well, LSU, and there's us, man. We got a 97 offense and a 92 defense, and we, can, we have a schedule that could take us to the national championship as long as we just take care of business, but... One thing that could hold us back is our special teams. You see that D rating, we have one of the worst special teams units in America coming into this season. That could hold us back in tight games, but other than that, we have a ton of talent on the roster. And I'm ready to make a move, man. Let's see if we have what it takes to make it to a national championship game. So we end up seeing the Memphis Tigers once again we win an American Conference Championship. That is two years in a row that we bring home that hardwood. But you can see we had somebody play spoiler, man. We end up losing one of our games and that is going to take us out of the National Championship hunt because we are not in a group of five, or not group of five, but a power five conference. So we don't get that same benefit of the doubt. We started off blowing some teams, and shoot, we even blew out Vanderbilt pretty badly. I love to see that. But our only loss came to SMU. We were at home for that as well. We lost them by a field goal. Definitely some revenge from beating them in the Fiesta Bowl last season. 
but we do finish the year strong, blow out Tulane, and then we also take care of business against Houston. So we do at least finish 7-1 in conference play once again, take home that conference championship. But now we await our fates in terms of where we go for bowl games. Now, last year we got to go to the Fiesta Bowl. Hopefully we get to go to some prestigious bowl once again. It's not always guaranteed when you're a group of five team, but scrolling down, I think we might get what we're asking for. And we are in looking, looks like the Orange Bowl, man. I'll be down with the Orange Bowl. We'll see if we end up getting that. And I'll get back to you guys with what our bowl matchup is actually going to be. But the good news in all of this is that we almost had one of our players win the Heisman Trophy. Rashawn Clark, who we got to stay. He tried to declare for the NFL Draft, but we told him to stay. He ends up finishing second in the Heisman Trophy race. Only finishing behind Tahi Spears of Tulane. So, we do see an American Conference player end up winning the Heisman Trophy. But we got a great game on our hands. We are going to the Orange Bowl. We are taking on the Clemson Tigers. Led by DJ Uye. You know what his last name is, but it's hard to pronounce. But we're taking on, on Clemson. They are a tough group of guys to go up, up against. No ACC championship for Clemson, but they are still really good. They're A pluses across the board, whereas we're A, A plus, A minus. We do have the number one scoring offense in America. And we do have one of the best turnover differentials in the country as well. 14 plus turnovers. That's good for number two in the nation. But Clemson's got a better roster, man. I mean, I'm not afraid to admit that. It's going to be a challenge, but let's see if we can overcome it and finish two years in a row with a New Year's Six Bowl victory. All right, boys. So we ended up winning the coin toss and deferring to the second half. But with that being said, let's go ahead and get this little Orange Bowl action officially underway as Clemson starts with the football first. And of course, no surprises here. They march down the field for their first touchdown. But we'll respond back in kind. We will get a touchdown of our own. And we thought we were going to take the lead. But Gunnar Gunnell does end up throwing an interception, unfortunately. So here we are. We're down by seven early. Trying to, you know, keep ourselves in this game. But Clemson, man, they are no joke. They play in a pretty tough conference. At least compared to the American. No doubts about that. But... Up down 21 to 7. Need to get our guys going here, but we cannot score before the end of the first half. So coming in down by two scores. We do end up getting a score right there. Can we get another score to tie this thing up? No, but we do end up at least getting a field goal there. Only down by four. And we do hold Clemson to a punt, but we can't do anything ourselves either. Still a pretty tight contested game. Four-point game. Just can't move the ball here really that much in this second half. And we might lose this thing if we can't get him off the field. And no, we cannot. So we end up losing the Orange Bowl. We lose and it's a close one. It was 21 to 17 being that final score. We'll check out these team stats real quick. I mean, it was really close. I mean, we had slightly more total offense. We had 189 for the, on the ground, 266 for the air. Clemson had nearly 200 yards of both rushing and passing. And the turnovers were what killed us today, man. We had four turnovers in the game. We lost three fumbles compared to Clemson's one turnover. That was the difference. Take away those turnovers, we probably win this game. As for our players that actually ended up playing in this one, Grant Gannell's final game ends up going 23 for 31, 266 in a pick. So not the best way to end his senior season, but... Lodrix Quarks, he had an up and down day, right? 26 carries, 134 yards, and two touchdowns, but also lost two fumbles too. Greg Gunnell did also lose a fumble, but did have 39 yards on the ground. Receiving wise, nobody had over 100 yards receiving today. It was definitely a little bit more quiet of a day for our receiving core, so not really much to see here. Devontae Dobbs and Corey Baker did have multiple pancakes in this one, but Kind of had trouble, kind of moving things. However, Jalen Sims went off in this one. 19 tackles, 4 TFLs, even got a sack in there as well. No turnovers, but that was what Devontae Golden Nelson is for. He ended up with 12 tackles and a fumble, which he did recover on his own. Also got Cameron Jackson to double-digit tackles too. 10 tackles, 4 TFLs. 
Unfortunately, though, we only got one sack. That was Jalen Sims. So besides those three guys that I highlighted on our defense, it wasn't really a complete effort. And just that was part of the reason why we end up falling short here in the Orange Bowl. But even though we don't end up winning the Orange Bowl, we do at least see one record broken. We see Gunnell break the season record for most passing touchdowns in a season that was set by Riley Ferguson back in 2017. We also see him break the most in a career that Brady White had from 2018 to 2020. And I wanted to see if there, I felt there was a third, but I might have uh, missed that one. But anyways, we do end up finishing 11 and 2 on the year. Still a pretty good year after all, but you know, just uh, just couldn't get over the top, unfortunately. Ganelvo does finish in the top six once again for passing yards. Ended up with 3,922 passing yards. That's good for six in the NCAA. Uh, Clark, who was a Heisman Trophy finalist, he ends up 29th in terms of rushing yards. And that was why Spears ended up winning in a landslide. He had like almost twice as many. It's a, it was really insane, actually. Uh, didn't have any receivers at 1,000 yards. Sims had 35 tackles, but nowhere close to the top. Mashburn again uh, led the team in sacks. He ended up with four and a half sacks, but you know didn't really have any elite pass rushers this season. And Tony Raby, I believe, is a safety. End up leading the team in interceptions. He ended up with four ints in this one. And finally, for kickers, we did have a really young uh, special teams unit. Uh, Grant was kind of like middle midway through the bottom. Longest kick was 45 yards. And that was good for 82nd in the NCAA. So this was a really special football team. And the reason I say that is we saw six of our seniors going to the NFL. Quindell Johnson and Rodriguez Clark, who we convinced to say are going to be first and second round picks. Our star quarterback, Grant Gannell, he also ends up being a second round pick as well. And then to round out the group, we saw Julian Barnett as a third round pick. And then John Cartwright and Javon Ivory currently projected to go into the fourth round and we don't lose anybody to the transfer portal so that ends up being a really cool thing to see now up to this point we actually did not bring in as many recruits as we did in previous seasons but we can still finish strong with this recruiting class for you guys i'm trying to key in on specifically is four star wide receiver brandon coley he's a 17th ranked receiver in this class but he is a gem and he has close to 90 speed that's not too bad for a possession guy we are the only uh, team that's going after him with an athletic scholarship we also are going after four star actually no five star athlete brad smith he's the 13th athlete in this class only first five star they're actually going after 78 overall he's got 90 speed as well so he's a speedster also surprisingly the only school that's we're going after him and finally, the last person I wanted to key in on specifically is Jay McNeil. He's a four-star outside linebacker from Georgetown, Kentucky. He's the fifth-ranked outside linebacker in his class. He's got good speed. He's, I like his athletic traits, and he can play good zone coverage right off rip, so he won't be a liability in coverage. Anything that we ask him to do, he can do it. Now, we are in a recruiting battle between us, Kentucky, and Cincinnati. I did put a few thousand points. Would love to come after some of these other guys, but those are my biggest priorities as of right now to add to a class that already does have some solid pieces, such as Ted McCoy, he's a two-star fullback, a gem by the way, David White, who is a four-star wide receiver, Corey Patterson, who is happens to be a four-star athlete in his own right, as well as Tommy Casey, Kevin Hines, and Bill Sykes. But with that being said, I am going to go ahead and get ourselves to signing day hopefully we can get all three guys that i'm really trying to go after and maybe get a little bit lucky with some other key additions all right so we do end up getting the two top targets that we wanted and brandon coley and brad smith and even though we don't get jay mcneil we do end up getting kevin perez who is an athlete in his own right plus i believe we did pick up you know adam bullock and we did end up stealing Mike Pitts because he's flashing his yellow. So I assume we stole him as a prospect. And then we also got John Van Miller who probably will get cut. On top of that, we did sign the top class in the conference once again. And we signed a top 25 class to go with it. So 
two straight years where we do have a top 25 class and three straight years where we do end up with the best class in the American Conference. And this time, we're in the teens. We finished with the number 16 overall class. Clemson, who we did end up losing to in the Orange Bowl, however, they do end up finishing with the number 7 recruiting class. As for us, we our class is composed of one 5-star, 7 4-stars, and 3 or 6 3-stars. So, really good class right here. Love what we brought to the table. Going to bring in a ton of offensive weaponry to help out whoever's going to be starting at the starting quarterback position next season. So we ended up signing three athletes in this class. And the big question is, where are we going to put them? Right now, halfback would make a lot of sense for sure. But we'll see if he could be a defensive weapon. And turns out, he could be. But I think like halfback's going to be the best for Brad Smith. So I'll go ahead and put him there. So that brings us up to four running backs. Is Kevin Perez a running back as well? Well, we could put him at quarterback, but we already signed four quarterbacks from the last class, right? So I really don't want to do that, uh, even though he is one point higher. I'm actually going to go ahead and put him at halfback as well. Finally, we have Corey Patterson, who's got that 90 speed to work with. Looks like he is a defensive weapon, though. Is he a corner or is he? Oh, he's a 76 free safety. Okay. So that puts him close to starting. Uh, he'll be battling for the backup spot along with Jeremy Johnson and Tommy Peterson. Probably will end up getting redshirted, though, but a good add. We'll see how much Eric Randall II develops. Another position change that I think I am going to go make, ahead and make as well is I'm going to move Marcus Phillips from the right end to, over to the left end. And that's because he's also a sophomore. Rom Taylor's ahead of him, and he's not going to be playing in, in front of Rom Taylor. But over on the left end, he might actually have a chance to go ahead and start right. Actually, no. I'm going to put him back over a right end. Scratch that. Uh, what I want to do instead is... Where does he go? Uh, Rob Taylor. I'm actually going to move him to left end so that he has a chance to start. He He's more likely to start uh, anyways. He's the second best defensive end that we got on the team. So that's a really important thing for me for sure. Linebacker. Anything we can do with the linebackers. Um, actually, we're looking pretty good at linebackers. So that's good. But I'm looking at this roster after the training results, and I think this is definitely a team that could take a step back in year four, mainly because we don't have as many NFL players, or at least NFL caliber players in my opinion. We do have Andrew Jones, we got Michael Baker, who we did end up recruiting. We also got Kajon Robinson and Rock Taylor, that is a heck of a name, so got a nice little wide receiver duo, but new court starting quarterback actually could be a toss-up between Keon Brown. He could be the placeholder, but Paul Kane, he is the future of this program, man. Freshman redshirt. He's an 85 overall, and he's 91 speed. Um, Don't know if I'll start him or not, but, I mean, he might be the future of this program. I, I usually don't mess with the depth chart, but I might have to make an exception. That 91 speed is hard to ignore. Running back, we do have some good running backs, so regardless on who this quarterback is going to be, we will have a nice tandem of running backs to work with in the stable wide receiver will still be sound there's no doubt about that tight end is good offensive line could be a little bit of an issue though we do have Mitchell Glaglius we do have Macon Pounders but then after that Chase Anderson 67 that's gonna be disgusting Corey Baker will be good and then well actually besides center will be fine um so maybe the offensive line won't be as bad as I think it's gonna be now, defensively, though, um, we might have some issues. Rob Taylor is only a 79. And, okay, actually, our defensive line is going to be solid. Um, linebacker, is linebacker going to be good? Uh, besides middle linebacker, yeah, we got looking good at middle linebacker. We do also have three good corners. And then we got some solid safeties, man. So, actually, we might not be so bad. We might not have as many stars. But, to be honest, we are kind of well-rounded. So, yeah, we're, uh, we're going to be fine. Uh, it is what it is. And uh, yeah, we're going to go ahead and uh, see how many cuts we need to make. All right, man. So we actually only need to cut three players from this roster this year. And I think it's going to be pretty straightforward. I am going to cut Eric Robinson because he is under that 60 overall threshold. But then after that, I mean, we got some older players on the team. Uh, Chase Anderson being one of them. 
but I can't cut Chase Anderson because he does meet the minimum. Uh, right guard, he's only a 64 though, so I'm going to go ahead and cut Bernard Williams. He probably won't play anyways. And then Daniel Robinson, I like his speed, but it just isn't working out at the end of the day. Or, no, actually, I'm going to go ahead and cut Lee Mobley instead. He's a 64 as a junior. Nah, you're, you're not going to be much of anything. I'm sorry. So, yeah, uh, Daniel Robinson, you got really lucky, my guy. But this is going to be our roster for the final 70. I'll jump in the red shirts, the schedule, all that good stuff as we get ready for year four. All right, so I know I'm probably going to be soft key on Brown here in real life. But, I mean, Paul Kane is just too fast to ignore, right? I mean, if the future is this kid, you know, we might as well roll with him now uh, and see what happens. So, Paul Kane, as a freshman, we're going to start with him. And listen, it might get a little ugly in year four. He doesn't have the highest awareness. But that being said, he is extremely athletic and he does already have a decent arm. So, we're going to rock with him for the rest of his rebuild. Well, now let's go ahead and take a look around and see what players that we are going to redshirt. Quarterback, we don't have anybody to redshirt. But I am going to redshirt these two running backs in Brad Smith and Kevin Perez. They're both buried on the depth chart, and they're not going to see the field for a little bit, but we got some youth. Really at these key positions, man. Talented players for sure, but they're going to have to be ready to step up if they, you know, want to be successful this season. Another move that I'm going to make is I'm going to redshirt both Ryan Bradshaw and Randy Ross because... You know, they're both still buried on the depth chart. We got three very solid defensive tackles already for our 3-4 scheme. We'll be fine without their services for the upcoming season. Another red shirt that I'm going to make is red shirt Brandon Carrington. Make him a red shirt freshman because he'll be behind a couple of seniors as well as a somewhat talented Patrick Robinson. And finally, the last red shirt that I want to make is Corey Patterson, who is a 76, and I love what he brings to the table. But again, same thing for him. He's going to be stuck behind some upperclassmen. And while he is fast, he needs to work on, you know, learning the playbook, learning the defensive schemes. Once he does that, I'm going to unleash him, and he's going to be a dangerous man. That being said, though, our schedule for year number four shouldn't be too bad, as we open up with four straight home games. Home games against Ball State, Bowling Green, Kansas, and Navy is pretty straightforward. And then it gets a little bit tougher. We got road games against Tulsa and Missouri. And then we finish the last, let's see, we got three home games towards the end. Uh, USF, UCF, got home against Tem Temple. And then our last road game is going to be SMU, who did knock us out of the national championship hunt last year. So I really hate them for that. Trying to get some revenge. And then we got home games versus Tulane and Houston to round things up. We got a decent number of home games, but there's a big gap between week four and week 12 when we have our next home game. So if we don't get them late or early, we're going to have to set up visits extremely late in the recruiting process. But regardless, despite what we lost, we do end up, you know, being in the preseason top 10 once again. We are at number nine, which I believe is where we started last year. But we aren't as talented as we are last year. We got a 90 overall offense and a 90 defense. So we did take a little bit of a step back. But we still have a really good team. And our special teams unit is a little bit better. So with that being said, I'm going to simulate all of year four now. We'll see what we end up doing. Especially with the new faces now coming into the starting lineup. Alright boys, so we actually do not complete the free peat for the American title. No sir. We actually finished second place this season. Actually, tied for second place. We tied with the Temple Owls, who did end up finishing number 17 in the nation. The Cincinnati Bearcats, though, did end up winning the American. They finished with a 9-3 overall record with a 7-1 conference record. We're also 9-3 with a 6-2 conference record. And, I mean, we took a little bit of a step back. I mean, Kane was kind of electric, 3,000 yards, 36 touchdowns, 15 picks. Adkins ended up with seven touchdowns on the ground as well, but we took some interesting losses, or at least it seemed like it on the surface, right? We lost to Kansas, which at the time was looked like a really bad loss, but they ended up 10-2, so that's fine. Also ended up losing to UCF in overtime, and then the last game of the season, we ended up getting blown out, actually, and that did seal the deal in terms of us not even able to 
clinch a um at least a share of the american title so definitely a tough look for us overall but we still had a really good season i know it's not the season that maybe that we you know hope for because of what we experienced the last couple of years but we're gonna still go to a bowl game and we're currently projected to go to the military bowl to face off against the army and army is not that good defensively so i think we can take advantage of them we'll see who we actually end up playing up against when bowl season comes around okay so not only do we confirm that we are going to the military bowl to play against the army institute but we do climb ourselves back into the top 25 as well a little bit of a disappointing year after starting off as a top 10 preseason squad but we do end up winning the chuck begnerick award which is a really good ad we also end up winning the nagurski on top of it so two defensive awards off the back speaking of defensive awards the dick buckus also going to be coming home to us so free defensive awards going to the university of memphis man and it leads us to this bowl battle against army now army you know they're a pretty fundamentally sound squad um they but they aren't that talented on paper c plus overall squad b minus on offense c defense we're b pluses across the board and lee corso is going to be rocking with us so with that being said we'll see, like i said we'll see if we can take advantage and let's see if we can send our seniors out on a high note at least win this bowl game so that we can have our third consecutive double digit win season all right boys so here we are at the military bowl and army won the coin toss and chose to receive a first man so you know what We'll make sure that they pay for it in a big way. Let's make sure we set a tone here in this first half. But there I say it, but Army actually passed the football quite a few times. That was a little bit more than what I expected. But we do end up taking a lead eventually. We take a 6-3 lead. We miss the extra point, though. So kind of struggling a little bit out the gate as Army is going to set up for a field goal of their own. So definitely a little bit of a score got me potentially nine to six game make that 16 to six as if we can just get string together there we go that was the team that i was waiting for 23 to six now as we go ahead we try to really set a tone here in this second half we got to let them know what's going on even the military bowl we respect the veterans of course but i'm trying to get to that double digit win season man straight up and down we're up 30 to 9 at this point going into the fourth quarter we should take care of business but i mean there's been some miracles that have happened in ncaa 14 so i'm not gonna have that fat lady sing until we i see officially double digit or triple zeros on that clock but we should be able to win this military bowl we win pretty convincingly we win by a final score of 33 to 9 as we'll check out the game stats for us here real quick at least for the team stats we look pretty good in this one 473 yards of total offense we ended up with 203 on the ground and 270 through the air the army though ended up with 120 yards on the ground and 292 through the air we did struggle on third down and we did end up losing the turnover battle but because we did have a more talented team that wasn't that big of a deal in terms of trying to go ahead and overcome that little difference to win this bowl game so looking at the stats for our guys as paul kane is actually an all-american so that might be a freshman all-american but paul kane does end up with 272 touchdowns and a pick definitely the future of this program jp morgan though had himself a day 33 carries 150 yards and a touchdown paul kane using that elite speed also managed to find the end zone nine carries for 26 yards in this one as for the receivers, Mark Colley Jones went off as well. Six catches, 148 yards, and a touchdown. JP Morgan actually also found the end zone through the air. He ended up with four catches in this one for 23 yards. As for the blockers, Corey Baker led the way with 12 pancakes in this one. We were creating a pancake house against the Army defensive line in front seven. So you love to see that. And then the defense rushed when Dole ends up leading the team in tackles along with rob taylor who ends up with nine tackles in this one cameron jackson also looked pretty good he ended up chipping in with seven tackles two tfls 
and two sacks. He was the only guy with multiple sacks. Avo, Dedrick Smith, Andrew Jones, and Rob Taylor did all end up getting sacks. So we did a really fantastic job of harassing this quarterback here today. We did also get an interception. Tyrell Raby ends up with an interception, so that's cool. And we also got a forced fumble caused by Jawan Odoms, which coincidentally, he also ended up landing on, on top of it. So good game overall. When you hold him to nine points, you're going to win a lot of football games. And that's exactly what happened here. So we will finish the season in the AP Top 25 poll once again. And one of our guys did end up in the top five statistically. My man Jones ends up number three in the country in solo tackles, 52 tackles. He brought home some serious higher wear as well. So you love to see that. He also ended up with eight and a half sacks. So that was the most that we've seen so far in this rebuild. And that's good for 15th in America. Meanwhile, Raby only ended up with three interceptions that led the team, but that was on the low end for Division One in terms of number one corners for interceptions. Now, do we have anyone in kicker? I don't think we did, but you know, you never know. Grant ends up with 58 yards as the longest field goal. That's good for 50th. As for Paul Kane, Paul Kane ended up with 3,300 yards of passing. That is almost in the top 10 you know that ends up you know 11th in the country Atkins you know was our main running back this year that's 140 if he had 809 819 yards rushing and then of course Taylor ended up with about 1200 yards receiving on the season that was good for roughly in the top 10 so you know we had a little bit of growing pains brand new quarterback you know had to get him used to the you know the speed of division one college football but year five though I think we're going to be in a beautiful position and speaking of year five let's jump into this offseason so we jump into this offseason realizing that we do end up getting a brand new defensive coordinator chad grasco is going to take over and taking over a top 10 defense you know the offense you know the offense was solid but i mean it was the reason why we lost a few games uh we couldn't get the offense going wasn't that consistent but defense should be really good and hopefully it can stay good for this upcoming season now over the course of this season i couldn't get as many guys to sign as what i usually do but at this point you know this is the we're going into the last year that we're doing this rebuild there's a few guys that i do want to try to bring in though because i think they could help us out in year five first and foremost chris ingraham man five star athlete number one athlete in america nobody recruited this guy somehow i don't know how that happened but right now we are in the lead for him so we put some points into him also got to go ahead and get some help on the offensive line as well as you know with our tight ends looking at jared allen for example number seven tackle in america ends up you know really good blocking stats for a true freshman so that'll be a good add adam gold he's gonna be extremely athletic not a great blocker needs to work on his blocking a little bit but his athletics stuff does remind me of a you know rob gronkowski who will probably be going to the hall of fame dave chandler is another person i'm looking at that dude is a gem great pass blocker so that'll be good hopefully get him away from washington state and then finally the last person that i'm going after is jay bell he is a five-star defensive tackle from Walnut Creek, California. He's got a really great power move, but needs to work on some other stuff. He doesn't hit that hard for the fact that he's two, six foot two, 285. So I think he needs a little bit of the weight room to get himself going, but we're really only going up against UTSA. So I like my odds of going, going ahead and bringing this guy in. But the only way to find out, of course, is if we go ahead and make our way over to signing day. We'll see what ends up happening there. All right, man. So to be honest with you, we did have a little bit of a mix back when it comes to bringing some players in. We missed out on Chris Abraham and Jay Bell, but we do bring in Jared Allen, Adam Gold, and Dave Chandler, along with Curtis Robinson as well, and a couple of depth pieces that may or may not end up getting cut, but... Once again, we do end up signing another top class in the co in the conference. I think we've done that every year in this rebuild. That'll be the fifth time that we've done that in five years. So you'll love to see that, by the way. 
um we did not have a top 25 class this year we were really close we ended up with the 27th class in america and doing so with five four stars and six three stars in this one so you know but we have a decent little thing but you know there's not just a little room between us and navy who did have the second best class in the american conference but hopefully this time around that means we can go undefeated since this is at least the fourth time in four off seasons that we did end up with the best class in the conference but even though we didn't get everybody that we wanted we still ended up for example we ended up with scott bowen jared allen nate mcdonald spencer flowers jay bell they must have sent the house on him because i put free k into him and we got crushed there adam gold's gonna be a good guy Dave Chandler and Eric Clay are going to round out our offensive line a little bit better. And then, of course, Curtis Robinson, Chris Lloyd, Steve Hobbs, and Jason Bullock. They'll be decent little ads as well. Okay, so as for position changes, one change that I did want to make because I did not have any athletes this year. I didn't sign any athletes. I'm going to move Marcus Watson over from right guard over to the left guard position because Corey Baker is ahead of him right now and I don't, he's not going to play in front of him so he'll have a better chance starting at left guard moving forward and man oh boy offensive line might be a little bit of an issue this year but you know we'll we'll, we'll figure out we'll find a way if there's a will there is always a way we don't have a lot of defensive linemen either so joe sims i'm moving over to the right hand side i can't move anybody else over because i'm kind of thin at defensive line but i could possibly move somebody over from defensive tackle now i'm looking at my defensive tackles i don't have a lot of speed but randy ross has decent speed he'll at least you know won't be as bad at right end you know he'll lose a few overall points but he'll eventually get that back he'll at least have half decent um have decent speed for like an edge rusher okay so as for position changes one change that i did want to make because I did not have any athletes this year. I didn't sign any athletes. I'm going to move Marcus Watson over from right guard over to the left guard position because Corey Baker is ahead of him right now and I don't, he's not going to play in front of him. So he'll have a better chance starting at left guard moving forward. And man, oh boy, offensive line might be a little bit of an issue this year. But, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out. We'll find a way. If there's a will, there is always a way. We don't have a lot of defensive linemen either. So, Joe Sims, I'm moving over to the right-hand side. I can't move anybody else over because I'm kind of thin at defensive line. But I could possibly move somebody over from defensive tackle. Now, I'm looking at my defensive tackles. I don't have a lot of speed, but Randy Ross has decent speed. He'll at least, you know, won't be as bad at right end. You know, he'll lose a few overall points, but... He'll eventually get that back. He'll at least have half decent, um, half decent speed for like an edge rusher. But going into the final season, though, this is what our roster has conspired to. Now, a couple of these guys were, you know, holdovers from season one. Andrew Jones is a prime example. He's the best player on our team. But guys like Michael Baker, Paul Kane, Cameron, no, not Cameron Wright, Juwan Adams. Javon Nelson, uh, Brandon Atkins, that's a big one uh, on this squad, man. And we got some dudes, man. We got some dudes on this roster for sure. Um, I'm excited to see what Paul King can do now that he has a little bit more experience. He's a 94 now. I'm ready to mess things up here in the American Conference and try to get ourselves to a conference championship game. We got two elite running backs. Fullbacks are going to be solid. Receiving core, we're at least good free deep. Might be four deep if I remember correctly. Tight end will be okay. Uh, offensive line might be a tad bit of an issue, but we've always figured things out. We got a 92 speed quarterback, so that kind of diminishes that little deficiency that we have on our team. Defensive line, looking good. Linebacking core, well, not the middle linebacker, actually... Yeah, the, the linebackers are not going to be that great, to be honest with you. But Jawan Odoms is a star. Zach Daniels and Jamara Clemens, they're going to be solid players. Eric Randall II is going to be good. And we know that Lewis Miller, who we did recruit, I believe, back in Season 1. He's out here now, and he's ready to ball out. So at this point, because we are going into the final season, 
I'm just going to cut straight from the bottom. I know that's kind of what I've been doing, but I've kind of taken into account, like, what class they're in. Like, like this sophomore, I probably would cut, but actually, I still will, because we don't need two fullbacks. He's going to go, but this 53 is going to go. Anyone that can't help us this season, they are leaving the team. But this is going to be our final 70, and I'm ready to get after it. Can't wait to see what this team is capable of. So with this being the last year of the rebuild, this is our final chance at immortality. We start off with home games going up against Vanderbilt, UCLA, Bowling Green, and then we start American Conference play. We got Navy on the road. Then our last, uh, yeah, it is our last non-conference game. We got Tennessee at home. So taking on two, two SEC opponents, three Power 5 teams. We're going to be ready for that challenge, though as it takes us into the rest of conference play and honestly we don't play a single top 25 team and we're not ranked in the top 25 which is really surprising but hey you know what if they want to sleep on us like that they can go ahead and do so because i love what this team is capable of i know we got some holes but we got a really great quarterback and because of that we're going to do some really great things i'll see you at the end of the regular season for year five to let you know how we do. Do we make it to a national championship? Or will we fall short in our last year of this rebuild? Alright boys, so here we are at the end of the year 5 regular season. And we actually put together an undefeated season for the first time, man. We are 12-0, and 0, but we are number 3 in the nation right now. So, well, the interesting thing is we got to see who the two teams are in front of us, right? We'll jump into these top 25 polls real quick. So, number one and number two are playing up against each other. So, I don't think, you know, like Washington or my, Miami or USC, I don't think anyone's going to hop over us. So, it looks like we're going to a national championship game. The question is, are we going to go play against Florida or are we going to go play against Alabama? We'll just have to wait and find out and see what the NCAA gods have in store for us. But before I go and show who we go up against, we got some more trophies, man. We got our man Jones winning the Dick Buckus Award, and that was really it. But where are we going to go? Is this our national championship appearance? Yes, sir, it is, baby. We will be number two in the nation. We get to take on the Florida Gators, man, one of the blue bloods in college football. On paper, Florida has a little bit more talented of a football team. However, we Corso is going to be rocking with us because statistically wise, you know, our stats are just a lot better what we've been able to do. Granted, maybe we haven't played as good competition as maybe Florida has had as they've taken on three ranked opponents and taken care of business. We, on the other hand, has only played one ranked team, and that's SMU. So, hey, man, we're here in the national championship game. Last game in this rebuild. Let's see if we can send this thing off on a high note. I'll see you guys on the field. All right, boys, so it looks like we are now here at the Rose Bowl, baby. We'll see if we can get the job done. Florida is, you know, favored, but... Let's go ahead and get this thing underway, man. Let's get the job done. As the Florida Gators start with the football, drive it down the field. And get a touchdown to get things going. Not a great start for us whatsoever. As we throw an interception on our side of the field, man, we cannot get away with any of that. And early on, it's not looking good, man. We're down 14 to nothing after one quarter. Make that 21 to nothing. We still have not put up any points yet in this game in the national championship game and oh it might be turning into a route 28 to nothing is the score right now we are just getting absolutely bamboozled flabbergasted whatever any sense of the word man it's 38 to 7 right now and we just got into the second half we have not done anything on either side of the ball but we do start to show a little bit signs of life. We do respond, making it a 13 to nothing run. Make that a 20 nothing run. So that, hey, hang on, 27 nothing run. Okay, so it's an 11 point game. We got a shot at this thing, but Florida's gonna get another touchdown. They might get the 50 burger on us, to be honest, and they do. They get that 50 burger, so they double us up officially. 
So there was a moment where we showed signs of life, but we're going to fall short, man. We lose 50, 52 to 27 in the national championship game, man. We do not bring Venati home to Memphis. And we just did not play well. I mean, Florida doubled us up in total offense. They had 260 on the ground, 384 for the air. We had only 80 yards of rushing offense and 227 passing yards. We could not get it done. Didn't lose the turnover battle, surprisingly. It was 2-2, two, two to two, but Florida did dominate the time possession. And when we even when we did have the football, for the most part, for the exception of maybe that third quarter, couldn't really do much of anything. So these are the player stats for our guys, as Paul Kane certainly has a bright future. I would be shocked if he did not actually declare for the NFL, but 227 yards, three touchdowns, and two interceptions here in the Rose Bowl to decide a national championship game. It's not bad, but, I mean, the defense didn't help much. JP Morgan chipped in with 59 yards and a touchdown on the ground. Receiving-wise, we see Cameron Wright, Michael Baker, and JP Morgan find the end zone through the air. Um, nobody getting to 100 yards, but Brandon Coley did lead the team in catches today. And up with six catches for 47 yards. So, wasn't as efficient with the catches as I would have liked him to be. However, that being said, our offensive line kind of held up for the most part. We only allowed a couple of sacks. So, that's really cool. That was concern of mine. Uh, Low-key going into this thing. Rob Taylor had a really nice game vote. 10 tackles, 3 TFLs in this one with Jamera Clemens and Richie West getting 9 tackles each. Only got to his quarterback the one time though. That was Patrick Robinson who ended up getting a sack. Also ended up with 2 TFLs and 7 tackles. And of course we had 3 forced fumbles today. Curtis Brown, Andrew Jones, and Adam Gold. Who actually, uh, I, I might have been off the interception because he's showing as a tight end or special teams. Who knows? But we did end up with two fumble recoveries. Also had a field goal and a punt block. So, I mean, they did what they could, but we just dug ourselves too big of a hole to try to get ourselves back into this thing, man. But despite what happened in that national championship game, I still felt like we did a really good job of rebuilding the Memphis Tigers. Year one was a little bit shaky. We were seven and six, but we won a bowl game there. And then we continued to rattle off. We rattle off two, three American Conference Championships. We won the Fiesta Bowl as well to go with it. Won the Military Bowl. And we made a national championship appearance. So let me know what you guys think about how I did in this rebuild. And also if there's any other teams that you want to see me build with the current NCAA rosters for the 2021-22 season. But with that being said, this is John Jay Gaming on the mic signing off. But I'm hoping you guys are all out there having a good one. Take care, everybody.